So welcome everyone. Before we begin today's webinar, I want to acknowledge that uh, Parachutes National Office sits on what has been the ancestral land of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabek Nation, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation since time immemorial to today. So welcome to the webinar, Why Injury Prevention is a Key Part of Healthcare. Injury is a complex problem to address. Anyone working in this sector knows that uh, very well. Uh, at present, public health is tasked with delivering injury prevention on the, on the one end of the spectrum, uh, while hospitals and trauma centers are, are tasked with responding to injury and undertaking some of that secondary prevention uh, actions. Traditionally, these systems have not worked as collaboratively as they could on a system level. There is an expectation within trauma centers to include injury prevention, but how much and how well is not tracked or measured. So in many cases, community agencies, public health units, trauma centers are effectively working with the same population, but without connection, strategy, or goals. So it makes a space messy, if you will, expensive, ineffective. So today we're going to explore how we can do better together, how we can create a seamless or coordinated approach to prevention. But first, how do injuries impact trauma, health, the healthcare system? In 2021, the cost of injury in Canada report that Parachute published shows that in one year, preventable injuries from collisions, falls, poisoning, drowning, and violence cost 29.4 billion, uh, which translates into $56 million dollars per day. So today, $56 million um, going to mostly direct costs. So the costs incurred by hospitals. Um, that makes up $20.4 billion of the 29.4. So you can see what um, an expense this has to the healthcare system and particularly hospitals. So while hospitals treat an injury after it happens, they have a vested interest in preventing them from happening in the first place. We'd all like to be put out of a job, I'm sure. So what we looked at from that report was thinking about what even a small reduction in injuries could result in, like a 20%, 10, 20% reduction. That money could be redirected to other priorities. And especially over the last two years, um, that has certainly been front and center for um, many people's thoughts. So today we have, I'm so pleased to have these three panelists joining our conversation, which I think will be the first of many. So uh, let me introduce them, give you a little bit of their background, and then we will hop into the discussions. Um, Dr. Richard Louis is the Provincial Injury Prevention Specialist for Trauma New Brunswick. Richard has a wealth of clinical education as well as a master's degree in health services administration from the University of Moncton. As an injury prevention specialist, Richard provides leadership and coordination to programs such as the Provincial Concussion Harmonization Project and the Finding Balance New Brunswick program. Rue Taggart is a registered nurse with her master's in nursing and holds an adjunct clinical appointment at the Lawrence Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing, University of Toronto. Rue is the Executive Vice President, Chief Nursing and Health Professions Executive at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. Rue provides professional practice leadership to nurses and other health professionals. She also provides executive leadership to the hospitals Tory Trauma, Dan Women and Babies, Schulich Heart, and Holland Bone and Joint Programs. And Megan Oki has been the Provincial Manager for Injury Prevention at the BC Center for Disease Control and a member of the BC Injury Research and Prevention Unit. She has 17 years of public health experience in Canada as well as internationally. Megan provides leadership in the province of BC and currently chairs multiple committees, including the BC Provincial Public Health Injury Prevention Committee. Megan has a Master's of Science in Public Health from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and a BHK in Exercise Science from UBC. So welcome um, everyone. Uh, for those of you in the audience, um, we will leave time at the end of, of this webinar for any questions. So please use the Q&A uh, section of the Zoom um, platform, which you can find uh, at the bottom of your screen. If you have any technical problems, if you can put those in the chat, we will be monitoring those as well. So I think that's all the housekeeping that we have to, to uh, um, 
uh, address. So Rue, I wanted to start with you and, and sort of hear from, from your perspective, you know, hospitals are positioned as that secondary prevention, a place to address what injuries have happened once they occur and try to mitigate any further, <laughs> further injury um, from, from happening. And, and public health units work on the, on the side of completely preventing an injury from occurring. How, in your opinion, has this limited some of the collaboration uh, between public health and the hospital systems. And then, you know, there's an impact on the individual who, who has sustained an injury. So if you can, you can talk a little bit about your experience um, in, in that uh, area and give us your insights. First of all, thanks so much, Pam, for, um, for inviting me here today. I'd say that at present, we've got a system that's pretty fragmented and without common goals. Public health sets their priorities, and the same occurs within hospitals, and I would argue that other relevant sectors are doing the same. For hospitals, we have a somewhat unclear mandate about injury prevention. Many lead trauma hospitals, like Sunnybrook Health Science Centre and many others across our province, are doing some work in this area. However, coordination of our efforts could be better. All of this puts us in a system that is at higher risk for having gaps and where patients may not receive the full benefit of a comprehensive and seamless approach to care, and that includes injury prevention. So in terms of addressing this, I'd say that it's the role of all sectors, whether it be public health or hospitals, to work together more closely. And we need to work together in a more coordinated way where we're all working towards common goals. And I know that there's other jurisdictions within Canada and beyond, and I think we're going to hear about that today, where there is greater collaboration and more of a provincial approach. And I think we, we here in Ontario need to learn from that. I acknowledge, though, that hospitals and public health and other sectors, we each play a role um, within sort of injury prevention and injury care, and we each may have certain areas of focus. But we have to make sure that there's intersections and again, healthy intersections and where we're all together at the table, having that common dialogue. Finally, I'll just end by saying I think hospitals are, are in a pretty good position to work together with partners and bring partners together. And I'll, uh, and I'll give you an example of why I say that. We already have forums in place where hospitals are coming together to look at sort of secondary care in terms of uh, injury care. So we have, a, for example, we have a regional trauma network where hospitals come together within a particular region and we talk about what else we need to do to help prevent injury and also treat injuries in the most effective possible way. So wouldn't it be great if we could leverage forums that we already have and invite other partners to the table beyond just hospitals and I think there's lots of examples within the province where there's opportunities to do that. I'm just giving you one example of what I'm aware of, and it's a network that, um, that I'm involved with, where there's a huge amount of opportunity to bring those partners together. Oh, you're on mute, Pamela. You'd think after two years. Um <laughs> Um, how, how many um, hospitals are in that network that you that you just spoke about, Rue? Well, the way in which we're organized uh, across the system, I think there's about three or four regional networks across the province of um, okay. of Ontario, and within ours alone, I'd say we've got at least forty hospitals alone within our wow. particular region. So that includes Toronto, GTA, and a little bit beyond that. Mm -hmm. The, the public health system is a, it, well, it's evolving in Ontario um, and shifting a little bit. Um, and one of the, I would expect one of the challenges is that the public health areas um, as they're carved out in the province don't necessarily match the hospital mapping. Is that, would that be correct? That's a hundred percent correct. <laughs> Every sector organizes themselves geographically in different ways. And so that adds complexity, but it's not insurmountable. 
And again, if we all agree on a common goal at a provincial level, I think we can effectively organize ourselves in a way, in a common way and agree to a common way in which we might want to do that. Yeah, I think that's that's what you know. We'll get to that um, around the systems question as well, but uh, that that is one of the, I think one of the challenges. Um, thanks, Rue, and I'll just stop now and and welcome Dr. David Evans. So we weren't entirely sure whether his schedule would allow for him to join us, but uh, Dr. Evans is the medical director of trauma services in BC uh, with the provincial health services authority. So welcome, Dr. Evans. Sorry for the exciting last minute entry. Um, <laughs> that's that's a previous title. I've, I've changed that role in the last. Oh, few years, look that's at okay. that. I'm still involved, but uh, I now lead a research analytics unit at TSBC. So after 10 years, uh, stepped out of the lead role, but uh, happy to participate. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you Sorry for. Awesome. Thanks for making the time. Uh, so and and perfect timing actually, because I'll I'll uh, turn it over turn it to to you and to Megan. The, the, you know, we're talking about the that space between or the connections between hospital and and public health. And in BC, you know, the trauma care providers are key partners in injury prevention. Um, I I looked at uh, you know some of the documentation out of BC, and we're we're eager to learn uh, a little bit about how that came about. How, as as Rue talked about, you know, there's there's opportunities that um, are sitting right in front of us uh, of current tables that, that people are sitting around. Uh, but can you talk a little bit, and, and Megan and Dr. Evans, I'm not sure which, who, who wants to go first, but um, you know, how, how did that come about in BC, that, that realization or that connection and, and relationship building? Can I start, Megan? Yeah, I was gonna say, you start. Yeah, well, it goes back a long way. You know, we've always had injury prevention as part of the trauma system, but always, you know, vaguely defined um, and not operationalized, more conceptualized. In fact, I would say trauma systems have defined conceptually more than operationally, and that's a problem. Um, and it's a, right across the country, a very similar thing. There's some connections to operability, but mostly it's, uh, it's well-meaning groups trying to work together uh, with kind of loose definitions of how they work together. Uh, but long story short is, like every other province in BC, we had an advisory council for the province on trauma. We invited injury prevention people. Didn't really, you know, have expectations for performance out of that or, or, or you know, what, and, and same for us as, as, as providers. And we did use the uh, American College sort of translate into Canadian um, um, level one to, to five standards, their, 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 uh, their accreditation guideline for how we were going to function as a system. But Bottom line is that uh, we weren't really uh, in, integrated into the power structure of the provincial healthcare system. We went, you know, uh, care went one way in the ministry, uh, injury prevention went another, emergency services went another, they weren't connected at the top for us. And so it was very hard to work, you know, at a higher level than, than at, the, at the patient care level. And so we had a big, big sort of uh, Kumbaya moment, I guess. We had a big hotel room, got some grant money, and put everybody who has anything to do with injury or trauma, uh, both in a, in a hotel room for a weekend, uh, all the way up to, you know, the executive directors of ambulance and population health and the coroner, and you name it. And we had a discussion about what do we mean by trauma system in BC? Like, is it just major trauma care? That's it. Ambulances, big hospitals, done? Or is it emergency preparedness, uh, injury prevention, public health, research, you know, policy development, like all of that. And, and the bottom line was we meant all injury and we meant the whole thing. Like it was really about controlling uh, injury, the burden of injury through uh, care, but also through prevention. So everyone had the same goal of reducing the burden, but we all do it in a different way. And so that was a really important moment for us because and we keep going back to that moment to talk about you know, we're all in the, the same game. We're really trying to reduce injury burden. What do I do as a surgeon that reduces it? What does Megan do as a you know, policy advisor and, and, a, and a knowledgeable public health person? Um, how do our organizations work together? And, and just every opportunity to align those things together, we've taken uh, uh, that opportunity. And I can talk later about what sort of what that looks like, but bottom line is we had a, a big discussion at, at a high level and we go back to, doesn't mean it can't change, but 
But when we talk about injury, injury management, we talk about care control, we mean public health, we mean care, we mean everything. So I'll stop that. I could go forever. I'll take a little hour. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a, that's a great. And I mean, it, it all starts with the conversation. And uh, I know Richard will agree with, with that um, out in, in New Brunswick. But Megan, did you want to chat a little bit about, um, you know, what has that meant from a public health perspective and especially mm -hmm. with your role in uh, BCCDC and the, and the unit? Yeah, the the event that that um, Dr. Evans is is referring to actually predates me, so it's been it's been a little while. So it uh, I wasn't actually there at that meeting, but but it is it's the, it was sort of the seminal moment I think. Um, and so what we've worked on since then is well, what does that really mean? You know, how does public health and trauma actually work together? Um, and and how do you do that when public health isn't resourced to do it? You know, it's, it's part of our guiding framework for public health in BC. It's goal number five out of our seven goals. Um, and yet it's not um, an area that's really historically been staffed within public health. So how do you even partner in, uh, in when you don't have capacity really on either side? And when public health, um, certainly when that seminal moment happened, had not even really defined what their role was in injury prevention. What do we do that, that is effective? What are our mm. priorities? You know, we hadn't been through that whole process yet. Um, and so I think um, uh, since, that, uh, since that time, what we've really worked on is, is putting together all the building blocks, and there are many, <laughs> <laughs> many, many, not just you know, sort of articulating how public health and trauma work together, but sorting our own house out in public mm -hmm. health um, so that we can create the right foundational opportunities to properly engage trauma and emergency and, you know, and the rest of the hospital system um, when it's needed um, and do that intentionally. So maybe I'll stop there because I know we can get into some of the details a little later. Yeah. That sounds great. Yes. Um, so, so Richard, we've talked a bit about systems, uh, processes uh, being barriers to, uh, you know, working together, uh, but also relationships with, you know, even just having other people in the healthcare system know about and recognize the burden of, of injuries. You know, it's a, we've had a recent con conversation about the fact that, you know, and Megan, you just touched on it, that public health even had injury prevention on their radar screen, you know, as a, as a, you know, the number one cause of death for Canadians under the age of 44 um, and a third leading cause of death for all ages. Like, it's just, it's a shock that, that, public health doesn't have um, a higher priority on this, but you're certainly making inroads in, in BC. But uh, Richard, maybe you wanna talk a little bit about you know, those, those system connectors. I know you, had, you have um, really worked hard in New Brunswick to pull people around a table, similar to, to what we've heard has happened in BC. Yeah, so similarly to what uh, was just mentioned earlier, a similar conversation was had uh, here in New Brunswick, mainly between uh, Trauma New Brunswick and Public Health New Brunswick in order to really get a recognition about who leads injury prevention in New Brunswick. Uh, that was, a, uh, there was an early recognition that expertise would rest uh, within Trauma New Brunswick, and that's where I came into play about a decade ago, uh, in order to provide that expertise around injury prevention with a provincial mandate. And that's what's really uh, different from uh, many other provinces where, where we're trying to coordinate injury prevention, having somebody that leads at the provincial level that can have that overarching uh, look at the different elements, uh, the different stakeholders, and to also be able to develop a strategic plan for the province so that using data, both from hospital, hospital data, RCMP data, all the different uh, sources of data to identify what the biggest gaps are and to pull the people, the right people together in order to help develop that provincial strategy. Once we have a provincial strategy, well, it's not done there. You have to continue with an operational plan in order to dedicate what are you going to do uh, during the next six months what are you going to do over the next three months in order to help move you closer 
to the uh, goals and objectives and the vision and mission of your strategic plan. Uh, one last thing though, uh, is also the development of a communications calendar. Because as you can imagine, there's a multitude of different uh, awareness campaigns that you could be uh, pulled into, but to have some type of uh, idea of when you would be focusing on which uh, injury topic using data in order to get uh, buy-in and the right stakeholders involved at the right time. Uh, because you don't want to burn out uh, certain stakeholders who are already so busy doing what they need to do. And especially when we're trying to reach out to hospitals, acute care facilities, having a really good, clear game plan with a clear ask of them is essential if you really want to have them on board and to uh, be able to move that needle. So once you have that person, that person is able to bring people together around the creation of a strategic plan, operational plan, you have a communications plan, everybody's on the same page. Well, then the first piece of real work is the setting of provincial standards. Like you, you mentioned, a lot of enti uh, entities don't even know what injury prevention should look like within their organization. So have it clearly defined what injury prevention should be, what your role and responsibility is within the larger overarching provincial injury prevention effort is really key. So I'm just gonna uh, stop it right there, but just to say there's a stepwise process that needs to be done Having somebody there that's provincially recognized, that's another thing. Just like with COVID, having a ch chief medical officer of health there is good and great. But if all stakeholders don't know that that person exists and that person is trying to, to, to get people together, well, that effort is not going to be happening as effectively as it needs to be. So having that person, developing strategic plans, and in turn, setting provincial standards, whether it's, for example, fall prevention, setting clinical practice guidelines, or looking at policies and procedures for, uh, for uh, discharge of an older adult from acute care to the community setting. So things like that can be done once the right players are around the virtual table or hopefully in person <laughs> as we uh, move away from uh, the COVID uh, response. But just to say, uh, it's all about getting together, talking, breaking down those silos and having those conversations. And the last piece, I'm gonna leave it uh, when I get back to uh, being able to uh, explain a little bit more what's happening here in Ukraine. Great, thanks Richard. Um, Rue, that, you know, what Richard's talked about is those, you know, like, you know, we talked about the, the systemic issues. I mean, you're, the hospitals are set up in a particular, way and the system that supports the work that they do and public health we've heard you know is is not in the same system although it's under the umbrella of health um how have you seen or have you seen and you've talked a little bit about some of those conversations starting to happen at the at the tables but um are there particular topics that lend themselves to be more um uh, amenable to that collaboration? Like, is it motor vehicle crashes? Is it fall prevention uh, or falls, you know, prevention, the treatment, and then out into the community? Are there particular topics that you see that might be you know, ripe for that kind of collaboration to actually demonstrate how this could work? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, just based on, and back to Richard's point, data. I mean, there's lots of trends in the data that we have. We know that there are disadvantaged populations that require targeted approaches to care, and it's across the continuum of care, not just hospitals focusing on one aspect of care, but it's all of us working together to address a pathway of care. So that's one example. We know that violence prevention, violence care intervention is also another area that has a, a significant that requires a significant area of focus. So the data is suggesting some very sharp signals and trends related to clear areas of focus that would be conducive to sectors coming together 
and collectively developing those goals and developing a pathway of care, including prevention to sort of post recovery and reintegration into the community. So um, I think we actually do know what the areas of focus are. I think there are very clear signals and there's lots of uh, discussion uh, amongst Ontarians at large around what they are. I think we just kind of need to get on with it and come together and start doing the planning and talking about those common goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that catalyst. Find he, Richard said, find the one person. It's like, who? Oh. <laughs> In some ways, it's, it's like, who is that one person? That may be the most challenging thing that that or step in the process. I know um, from internally in the hospital, you know, we often think of you know trauma and emerge as the as the two major points for you know injuries. But I know when I worked at Sick Kids, you know, looking at you know orthopedics, the burn unit, um, optometry, you know, they, they just is across so many of the hospital departments as well. And maybe Rue, you can start and maybe David will pull you in as well of, you know, what are the conversations going on internally, you know, at Sick Kids and, and other hospitals? Yeah, I mean, I, um, first of all, I'll, I'll say that mostly trauma hospitals are, are looking at injury prevention. So they are, they are doing work in that area and actually quite substantive work. I, um, I would love for it to be a little bit more coordinated where we had more of a broader plan, but there is good pockets of work that is happening. So I would say that we're already, and, uh, and on the other end of the spectrum, after injured patients are sent back into the community, after they are reintegrated in, into the community, we are looking at interventions and ways in which we can prevent them from re-injuring themselves. So we are looking at that full cycle of care. Mm -hmm. And again, I think the work that we're doing is impactful. I will say the work that we're doing is under-resourced. There isn't a common platform to uh, continue to thrust this forward, probably in an expeditious way. And I think there's lots of opportunity there for us to get this to the next level and the next level after that with some enablers um, that are created, more enablers across the system. Mm -hmm. David, did you wanna respond as well? Oh, I think you're muted. Yeah, I'm back. There we go. Okay, great. <laughs> you know, back to Ruth's comment, you know, about knowing where to put effort. I think it's I think it's intuitive and I, I, I'm a little bit more skeptical. And the only reason I say that is because, you know, I, I think there's many ways to look at where the pressure points are uh, to get the most bang for buck out of an injury prevention initiative or a new policy or, you know, I don't know, and, and what's even achievable, you know, versus desirable. And I would just kind of take the, the sort of more dispassionate view that, that we need a better system of counting injuries, number one, because I think mm -hmm. even, I don't know if, it, I mean, I'm, this is not my bailiwick, but from what I can glean, there isn't really a standard approach to injury um, screening you know, or injury surveillance across the country. Like we need one way of doing that. So we can start to compare, you know, what Ontario or, or other provinces New Brunswick does and how effective it is. Like who's got the lowest rate of whatever and why? Um, sometimes that's not because of what you did. It's just who your population is and what they're at risk for. But, but I think we are lacking a standard approach to injury surveillance, number one. Yeah, even in BC, we haven't got you know, a pan-provincial approach to counting injuries. And then to that, I think we need to add, like, what is the burden of those injuries and how modifiable are those injuries, you know, is that pathway? Because, you know, as a, as a trauma surgeon, I can tell you like there's some patients we put a lot of resource into, they take a lot of space in the hospital. Um, and that's just my perspective, perspective. So you just can't count them as equally, you know, we've got five of these and 10 of those, and we got to work on the one there's 10. But there are some patients that eat up a ton of resources, get very little benefit from it. And I think, you know, measuring burden in these different ways is really, really important. And that's where I think this connection between public health and, and the acute side is, because we, we can do that. We can measure the burden of every admitted patient or every encountered patient, if you want to go that far, and, and add that. So now you have a, sur a surveillance program that counts all the injuries and, and also tells you how much damage they do to themselves and the healthcare system. And then I think you look at, okay, well, what can we do about 
you know, motorcycle crashes or ATVs or gunshot wounds or whatever. Um, and then you have a conversation that Megan's been kind of brokering with what's modifiable in this pathway that makes sense, you know? And so I think that's kind of the way I look at this. And I, I think parachute could be really great at pulling together a national approach to, you know, just aid accounting and beta measuring burden. So we all produce comparable reports on the measure of injury, you know, injury as a, as a public health problem. Yeah, you've hit on you've hit on another another of the system issues, I think, with the with the data and you know with the cost of injury, we're collecting you know we're working with the public health agency and and you know coronial data sets and things like that that are part of the larger healthcare system. So we don't have a huge amount of influence on how, like at what time. So one of the real challenges is you know, how current is this information? I mean, we put out a report in 2021 that used 2018 data. That was as fresh off the, you know, presses as we could get at the time of, of doing the report. And to a lot of people, and I think it, it sort of came to a head in, in the last couple of years with, you know, people asking questions about the healthcare system around COVID and number and how they're tracking. And we're surprised that there were certain things that people couldn't, the chief medical officers of health were coming out and said, we don't track that. Um, and we, and I think most of the public was shocked. So uh, we often get um, surprised at the fact that that's the most recent data that we have. And then is it collected, um, you know, are the ambulatory, you know, the, the uh, admissions data that we only have a couple of provinces that have that and how do we get to that? We do, apply uh, that the um, financial, the economic tool does get to the resource intensity weights. Um, so we can tell that, you know, those that are 85 in hospital, you know, that have from a fall are taking up a significant amount more of resources um, than, you know, somebody who's 25 and have a, have a similar fall. Um, but one of the challenges, and I, you know, I don't, this isn't going to be solved, but is, the the injury itself happens in a different sector a lot of the time so it happens in the transportation sector or in the long-term care sector or just in the community you know somebody at home um, but that burden of the of of treating that is in the healthcare system and so i was just talking on last weekend to somebody about the fact that you know if if the transportation system you know invests all kinds of resources into making the roadways safer and putting in separated bike lanes, et cetera. The, the, this health savings is not going to affect them. They're not going to reap the benefits, if you will, of this investment other than the fact that it, the road is safer. And so there's this, there's, there needs to be some way um, outside of the data, the surveillance system itself to kind of allocate some of those um, some of the benefits, especially the financial benefits uh, around prevention of injuries. Uh, Richard, I don't know if, you know, from a provincial standpoint and, and talking, you know, uh, at the tables that you are at, um, it, you've had folks like the transportation folks around the table um, and talking to the healthcare folks. Has that uh, come up as, as an issue with them or uh, have you not gotten to that level of, <laughs> granularity yet? Well, well, essentially, yes, we do have, uh, we did create a road and trail safety collaborative about a year and some change ago, uh, where we did invite key stakeholders, our CMP, Department uh, Transportation and Inf Infrastructure, Justice, Public Safety, all the, the key players around the table, in order to discuss what could be a, a collective impact approach to road and trail safety. So with that, you can imagine we, we spent a lot of time having our data analysts talk to each other in order to identify the hotspots, the key areas of the province where we might see uh, higher rates of injuries uh, due to uh, motor vehicle collisions or uh, ATV use. With that, obviously, there's a recognition that each other in, the, in the, our own silos could impact so much of a, a effect on the ground. The conversations that we're having is being able to pool our resources 
in order to number one, have a more robust awareness campaign, but also being able to uh, apply um, a collaborative effort with education, enforcement, engineering, and enactment of new policies done collaboratively and focused at the time of the year where we do tend to see uh, higher rates of injuries due to MBC. So that's one example mm -hmm. of us working together, not trying to reallocate savings to uh, acute care facilities, for example, but being able to save uh, with regards to cost by pooling resources and having a greater impact on mm -hmm. the ground. Yeah, I think that's that really celebrating strategic. our small wins and going yeah. that way, right? Baby steps towards yeah. the right direction. This year is going to be our first year where we're going to have our uh, safe uh, road and trail safety awareness month this August, 2022. So obviously it's going to be smaller than what we're going to do next year and the year following and the year following that. So really for us, it just starts with a conversation, having the right people around the table, being able to save money so that we can build uh, for uh, subsequent years. Yeah, I like that pooling of resources. You know, I've got this much, you've got that expertise. How do we, how do we knit these together? So it's sort of um, breaking down the silos at that level versus trying to change the the overall system because we know we know that what gets you know set as a priority, somebody has to report on it, and it's resourced uh, as as Ru brought up um, as resourced uh, at, appropriately. You know, that's where you see. Be, you know, change made fairly quickly, um, and um, and successes, and and sort of measurable in that in that way. Megan, you know, going back to some of that data <laughs> data issues, you know, the um, you know there there used to be a trauma registry. There used to be a national trauma registry. Um, we don't have that anymore. Um, you know, we we seem to have lost some of the ex, the uh, ability to access uh, the the data. Um, I know BC has has some connections, you know, some systems around that. What what would you like to see, you know, that this collaboration between trauma and injury prevention um, achieve? If uh, you know, with the data, um, the data questions about how do we get more data, more contextual data, as as David talked about, you know, that's the key mm -hmm. for prevention. We you know, the numbers are one thing, but it's the context of the injury, what's really happening that really drills it down and focuses, uh, focuses us on the right intervention. Yeah, well, there's probably two things I would wanna say about that. I think, I think the first is how important it is for public health and trauma to work together along with academia um, to build essentially what we're trying to do in BC, one source of truth on injury data. Mm -hmm. And that includes all of our administrative data sets, including the trauma registry. You know, it include it, it is um, it is a place um, where us within health um, can ensure that even within the province, we're comparing apples to apples and making sure that that's all, you know, right. Yeah. And then um, and then the second part of that, um, and this is something that actually um, uh, Dr. Evans and myself um, and the injury prevention lead at Vancouver General Hospital are, are looking at quite closely is how to use that intelligence from trauma patients to inform injury prevention. And, and I, I am really excited um, to see this work move forward, interviewing trauma patients, trying to find out what happened at the time of the injury. Um, and the circumstances around this. We did this quite successfully, actually, in a lot of our pediatric hospitals um, if, with the CHIRP program, mm -hmm. um, but we don't do this a lot with our adult hospitals. And, and, and as, as David and I have been working together over the years, we've thought, oh, this would be, this is intelligence that we really could use to hone in on those serious injuries and, and deaths. Um, and so I'm hoping that from a data point of view, that, um, that will um, bear fruit. I think we're about to head into a feasibility study um, on how we might be able to do that um, because it's an untapped resource. Um, uh, and um, certainly research from around the world that have looked into various causes of injury and have done interviews with patients post-injury, um, there's been 
a tremendous amount of rich information that has allowed injury prevention initiatives to progress in leaps and bounds. It has provided also patient voice to move uh, decision makers to enact policy or legislation and so on. So it's um, definitely something that um, I think I look forward to uh, presenting in the future. Uh, actually, not myself, it'll be Joanne Sadler, <laughs> the injury prevention lead for Vancouver General Hospital. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And, and I think you, you brought up, you know, an important point there because it, you know, the, the involvement, um, you know, the public health, um, folks and, and injury prevention folks are, are looking at how do we get access to that rich data and the, the CHIRP, the Canadian Hospitals Injury Reporting and Prevention Program. Um, it is not population-based, um, so it, it's, it's a snapshot, but it's so rich, as you say, in detail about what was happening around the injury. Um, and the, the, those details uh, are missing largely across the country. Um, how do we access that? And, and the role that, that trauma programs um, can play in in you know leveraging that that data that could be could be collected it's the time intensive kind of data it's not the numbers data where that gets fed into a system but it's more about the narrative um, from the individual but but you also touched on a really important point um, that uh, I'll open it up to to anyone who wants to respond but you know there is this role of advocacy in as public health people, as trauma folks who, and as people with lived experience, those, those people who have um, either completely avoided an injury and why, or have gone through uh, a traumatic incident and, and can really put the human face on that data. Because it's one thing to, to talk about the, the numbers and even the con context, but it's uh, something else to tell the story about an individual and the fact that these are not single individuals. This is a single story, but this happens, you know, X number of hundreds of times every year across the country. Um, so is there an opportunity there that we could tap into um, to, uh, you know, as as parachute as a national organization, as you know, Trauma New Brunswick as a provincial agency, as is there a there an opportunity to tap into some of those experts to help further the cause of injury prevention? Yeah, I can speak a little bit about uh, that. Just to say David, that yeah. you know, we've been talking about data uh, with regards to numbers, but there's also, like Megan mentioned, there's also research. Uh, in order to understand what's doable, right, uh, within your strategic plan, what can you do? What's what other provinces have tried, and go, being able to collect that data, going to conferences, for example, fall prevention conferences, is a great way to learn directly from those researchers who have that experience on the ground. But also, sometimes you might have uh, older adults who were the recipients of those services who would be able to uh, give their account uh, directly mm -hmm. about their experience going through that research project. So those, those are indirect ways of getting a sense of what's happening uh, with regards to uh, the, the effectiveness of a intervention and how per, uh, older adults perceive uh, the usefulness of that specific intervention. But the next step would be to in turn do the same type of exercise within your own province to actually uh, test out, uh, call it a pilot project, do the same. So for example, here in New Brunswick, we're going to be piloting a fall prevention clinic model, something that's been done in BC. Uh, so from that, we'll definitely be able to uh, ask uh, older adults who are going to be participating in that pilot project about how they like that specific intervention and being able to interact uh, uh, that way with older adults in order to see how we can modify and evolve those type of services in order to make it even better uh, here in New Brunswick. Great, thanks Richard. David, did you have something? Yeah, I have a couple little points. So number one, I think just to reiterate what Megan just said, I mean, just bringing all your data sets together so they're one data set is really, really helpful and having you can have great compelling stories, you know, a trauma surgeon can talk about and, and the impact on a family and a patient, but if you can 
immediately in real time pair that up with some background data that's really meaningful. It's not just this one story. It's like this happened to 30 other people and that whatever. I think that's why you need this marriage of kind of advocacy and, and a really agile data platform. And the other thing is, you know, about adding better data, um, I think that um, I think there's things that I, I envision we could do in BC. One of them is, you know, we have a tertiary survey, which is the last, you know, we have one last look at the patient, add up all the injuries, make sure we haven't missed anything, review the radiology. But, but I, I'd like us to see, and that's what our project's kind of about, as a quarterly survey where, you know, we go and sit with the patient and talk about what happened and see what the, their insights are about, in, you know, the preventability of their injuries. I think that's really valuable for two reasons. Number one, um, it gives you an opportunity to address the, the, the potential for reducing recidivism with that individual patient and their family. I don't know how valuable that is, but, but I think it's almost inconscionable to me that we would admit these people care for them and not talk about what happened. And I think we need to standardize and institutionalize that uh, with all our patients. And this project that we're doing is kind of a feasibility study to see who, who's willing to talk to us, who's able to talk to us. Uh, that's, but the second thing is, you know, what insights do those patients give about, you know, immeasurable opportunities for, you know, for um, changing the design of a, of a, of a system, uh, of a road system or whatever it is, you know, like what really happened and who can really talk honestly. I'm not as hopeful about that, but you never know, right? Like, so I think uh, ask patients or families, like what really could have changed this outcome? I ask patients that all the time, like what would have you prevented you from coming here? And uh, I think standardizing that, uh, mm -hmm. that conversation is something all trauma centers could do. And that, and that data can go into the registry and be linked to all the other data we have. And so that's really easy. And the other thing I'd like to see happen is uh, just like family doctors do, you know, an annual comprehensive visit, I would like to see every trauma patient get a one year and a two year that's, you know, maybe paid a little bit higher, you know, there's a standardized questionnaire by the GP that takes care of like, how has this injury impacted your life, right? And that can go into our, our, our registry as well. So we're not just saying, uh, you know, our best outcome data is lived or died or discharged uh, acute care or, you know, long-term care like that. And that's where it ends pretty much. So if we could say, you know, this person really missed work for like nine months and or, or all that stuff could be captured in a one year or two year follow up by the GP, which is part of our system and get paid for this little, you know, more complicated exam. We haven't talked about that a lot, but mm. we've been thinking about. So this way you're not hiring researchers to go get the data. It's part of their it's care. Part of the care. Yeah. I'm Ruth, just going to mention, I'm oh. just going to step in go and ahead, just Richard, saying, then, I'm writing that down because that's a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> There you go. You heard it here. <laughs> I love the idea too. Go ahead, Ruth. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would just say that I like all of the practical suggestions that people have commented on. <clears throat> From my vantage point, I'm just not sure that I'm aware of what the burning platform is. I mean, I think it's, it's getting created. I, your reference today about the fact that the economic burden of preventable injury is quite significant and maybe that's the start the starting point of creating that burning platform but we all need to agree uh, on what that burning platform is and what those key messages are for government for the politicians and then start um, a coordinated advocacy effort so I think the the skeleton is there you've already talked about it Pamela people have already talked about practical ways in which we can get more information and and how we can further inform the advocacy platform. But um, I think we all need to agree on what it is. That's the first step. Great, go ahead, Megan. I think, I think we've done that quite successfully in BC. Well, to a certain extent in BC, certainly within public health and trauma has been part of this actually the whole way. So in 2016, um, all the seven health authorities, the BC Injury Research Prevention Unit and the BC Ministry of Health, we embarked on doing just that, setting injury prevention priorities. You know, there's not a lot of resource in this space. What are we actually going to use our time and efforts on? Um, and so we went through a three round modified Delphi process that used a whole series of ranking criteria. And it wasn't just the data, it was that modifiability. Like how, how much evidence is there for us to be able to intervene? Is that intervention acceptable to the public? You know, is it actually feasible within our system and can we evaluate it? Um, and so once we had those priorities, you know, that, that was agreed to by consensus, 
that allowed us to then start planning uh, in a very intentional and, method and, and methodical way um, in our priority areas of, of road safety. So, um, so we have recommendations for action that have come out of the BC Injury uh, Prevention Committee, which is again, all those, um, those nine actors I, I spoke about. Um, we have recommendations for action around seniors falls, our second priority. And we're just in the process of uh, developing recommendations for action for youth suicide and self-harm, because that was our third priority. We were just in the middle of that before the pandemic started, um, and now we're picking that work up again. Um, and I think it's a great way to sort of galvanize when you have um, uh, not a lot of resource and capacity in this area, particularly both on public health and trauma side. You sort of have to narrow in, decide what you're really gonna try to, to focus on so that the efforts are actually effective. And I think, I think we've got, a, the, I guess, the systems in place uh, to start to really um, uh, try to, to work on that. Um, and we've also been successful very recently in increasing the capacity in injury prevention in public health. For the first time ever, we now actually have a position in every health authority, uh, every, sorry, every regional health authority. Um, and so I think that's quite key because then that provides a partner with whom trauma can then partner with. Um, and I think that's a, a critical element because yes, of course we have these big provincial priorities, road safety, seniors falls and youth suicide and self-harm. But every once in a while you get sort of the odd things that come up where you have to act, you have to be able to re react as a region and having that public health capacity and, and um, immediate links to trauma will allow for those advocacy efforts, those policy efforts, perhaps it's programs, grants, whatever it might be. Um, so that structure I think has served us um, quite well so far in BC over the last few years. Um, it could always be improved. There, there's a lot that we need to, to work on, but so far, so good. I think we've, yeah, hit on something. That's great. Well, yes, and um, one of the things that we do very well in injury prevention is share across the country. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's it's something that we can take and, and BC is often on the leading edge of, of things. So that's, thanks for sharing that, Megan. Um, I'm going to, I'm just looking at the uh, clock and I'm going to turn it over to Kelly Tian from Parachute, who's, I think we have one question. Um, and then I have some, uh, I can talk about uh, the hospital challenge that folks on the line might be interested in. Oh, Kelly, you're muted. <laughs> We are doing it again. Yes. So a question from Kyla, and that is how to coordinate efforts with our mental health and substance use partners to address the high burden of injuries related to self-harm and substance use related injuries. So taking it, we are looking here at public health, we're looking here at hospital trauma units, but how do we reach out to mental health and substance use partners in this quest to prevent injury? Great, I'll open that up to anyone that wants to start. I, I could say something. I, I think that's the, the that's the really big question right now. You know, for when I look at burden of injury of the patients I take care of, 30% of them have those issues. And yeah, we patch them up and yeah, we attach the social work and, and talk to drug addiction and, and chronic pain and all that. But they go right out back where they came from most of the time. And you know, I would love to see something that is much more innovative and almost where we would, you know, discharge those people to a unit where where they can have ongoing medical care, but that a lot more surrounded, you know, I don't know, life care. I don't know what it, what it is. Sometimes it's mental health, but I think the ones that really stand to win something by changing their directions, are, they're not badly mental health. They're in difficult situations. They got drug addiction, whatever else. And, and I think by keeping them in our system in a sort of different non-medicalized space with the right people around them, like we do for some of our patients is the only way to deal with that. Uh, uh, we have to figure that out because it's uh, it's the sleeping giant, as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Rue or Richard, did you want to weigh in on that? I mean, I, I would say the principles are the same as what we've commented on before, and that is bringing the sectors together and developing those common approaches. And I agree, mental health, uh, the mental health sector is a really important component of of an impactful intervention or approach. And just to put uh, my little spin, but really it's learning from those who have that experience. 
And here I'm looking at BC, you might be the first ones to actually come up and pilot uh, that solution. Uh, knowing fully well that you seem to have that capacity, uh, newly developed capacity to, to look into those things, or even being able to have those conversations at the national level uh, through uh, different platforms like the Canadian Collaborating Centers on Injury Prevention, where we have regular meetings with stakeholders in order to discuss uh, you know, those type of topics. So really, it's going to be a collaborative effort with all key stakeholders in all provinces and territories in order to see how we can address this issue together, because it might have started or become a, a big thing in BC, but gradually we're seeing bigger and bigger numbers uh, out east and now in the Atlantic provinces, even though, uh, you know, personally, it's not part of my mandate to look after, uh, you know, those type of uh, injuries. I am definitely cognizant that it's a thing. Uh, and for myself, being able to raise that issue at those type of conversations that I'm part of, even though it's not part of my mandate, to at least be sure that it's part of this provincial strategy for injury prevention and mental health and, and violence prevention. So there's many different tables, but to be sure that at least at one of those tables, that specific issue is being addressed comprehensively. Yeah, I, I said I said in my opening that injury prevention is complex, and I think this conversation has demonstrated that um, certainly. And we've only really scratched the surface, but the the um, the themes I think that have come from this is that there it change is possible. Uh, you need somebody or a team of somebodies that are going to help to connect all of these sectors, um, and we need to. Uh, agree on those priorities. What are we going to, what are we going to um, address first and how are we going to measure our success? Because that's, I think, key in being able to show why this is so important to do, because we know a lot of the solutions. It's a matter of getting them implemented and measuring and being able to show that the, there is change. In the short term, um, there is, uh, National Injury Prevention Day is coming up quickly. It's July 5th, and this was started uh, a number of years ago to um, celebrate Parachute's annual birthday. Um, this year, it's 10 years. We're turning 10, if you can imagine. Uh, it uh, is really a um, it's really a, a decade that has flown by. Um, but it's also a day to pull all of those sectors together. We get a huge amount of uh, social media postings of people involving themselves in National Injury Prevention Day from workplace, from uh, the legal community, from occupational health, from our injury prevention folks, from the media, like it just, it really pulls everybody together under one um, umbrella or parachute uh, that, you know, people have a, have a, see themselves in that day, no matter where they're working in injury prevention. So we've launched this year, and Kelly's put it in the chat, a link to the hospital challenge. And that was uh, to, to try to engage hospitals who, a number of them have have supported and participated in National Injury Prevention Day from the very beginning. But in this particular year, we thought we would launch this challenge and we're going to do it year over year. There's some ideas on how you can raise the profile of injury prevention in your hospital, how we can help you do that. Um, and at the page, you can see some of the hospitals that have signed up with uh, some description about what they're planning to do on July. July 5th. It certainly isn't the only day that can be that you can do stuff, uh, but it may be a way to start to have conversations if they aren't happening um, or to raise the level of conversation in your hospital around injury prevention and the connection to healthcare and trauma, um, trauma care. So we are at three o'clock. I want to make sure that I respect everyone's time and thank all of you um, for joining this webinar. It will be recorded. Uh, it, please share it with folks that uh, you think would be interested and may not have been able to join us today. Uh, it'll be on our YouTube channel and we will send out a link in a day or two to it. So thank you, Rue. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, David. Thank you, Megan, for 
uh, participating. It's been a really interesting conversation. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>